lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. We had an uh, unexpected break there. Yeah, we took a little, had, had a little time off, as yeah. it were. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, y'all. It's, uh, um, I don't know, family health issues. Yeah, yeah it happens. Like yeah. I say, part of it. But you're back with a beard, I see. Yeah, that's not going to last long. <sighs> I, I, I was hanging on to that for a specific purpose, and that has gone away. So, like um, the beard, man. I'm just saying. I, I know you do, but it, it's the it's the December <laughs> beard. It's supposed to be gone long ago. I actually yeah. did shave it off at the new year, like I always do, but I grew yeah. it back. Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> well, it's, I'm going to shave it off again. So, <laughs> well, I'll be disappointed as soon as we get past this little cold snap. Oh yeah, I, I, I think I will hang on to it through this little <laughs> through, cold the, snap. through the cold. When, well, it's 20 degrees outside. It is nice to have the beard. Absolutely. Yeah. Even though I keep it short, but it it breaks up the wind. Still though, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly does. Certainly does. Um. So, uh, you know, I I hope everybody else has been having a better time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You had some uh, some vehicle issues in the meantime <laughs> yeah man my car it's been a mess man we would have recorded yesterday but i had major car issues again yeah. like <laughs> uh, didn't even barely got it out of the shop i got a few miles up the road and had to turn back <laughs> yeah that's never a good feeling no no not good when there's smoke billowing from the hood <laughs> like coming in through the vents and like everything like there was so much smoke i've never seen so much smoke <laughs> So I thought there was a fire. I figure that can't be true, but okay. <laughs> it was a lot of smoke. <laughs> it was it was it was rough, man. Well, um, a, a lot has happened since last time we recorded. I don't even remember when the last time we have we recorded in February. I don't think we have. I don't know that we have. Mm. I think we've been. Yeah, I don't think we have. I'd have to look. I don't know, but yeah. it's been a minute at any rate. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, sorry everybody. I I know that having a what I should have done actually is put up an old. Episode. Oh, we had those old ones, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I could put up. We have one more that we um, have a good recording of that we didn't, that wasn't published where anybody could really get to it yeah. long, long ago. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about uh pulling one of our earlier episodes from when we relaunched. Oh yeah. And putting that back up there, just you know, record a new intro, put it up there. Yeah. I, I was thinking actually, well, I'll just do it next time and you'll see which one I had in mind. Oh, you guess. got one in mind. I mean, yeah, whenever this comes up again, if it if it's if we're going a couple of weeks without recording, I'm just gonna just republish an uh an older episode. Yeah. Um, because it's unfair to not Have give nothing content. Out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even though it's not new content, you know, we've had a we've had added a lot of a lot of new listeners since then, so maybe they didn't oh, yeah. hear that early stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And some of it, at least, is really good. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Although the recordings aren't as good. We got these new mics after. Like, yeah. You know, it was still better than average, though, I would say. Yeah. Oh, I'd agree. I mean, yeah. we just we just got even better with the new mics. Yeah. So, yeah, it was already solid before, mm -hmm. I thought. I think so, too. Some of our older listeners may disagree. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, let's get into it though. We've <laughs> we've yeah. we've wasted five minutes already. Yeah. Um, so we did want to talk about the GameStop stuff yeah. a bit. Um, to the moon, <laughs> GameStop to the moon. Can you summarize like what happened? Um, I mean, kind of to the best of my ability. Like, I'm not big on the stock market. I mean, I understand some mm -hmm. of the stuff, but I don't. I don't have a whole lot of money floating around out there in the stock market. But best I can gather is there's this group of redditors on this Reddit page, mm -hmm. and they basically and the page has been there for a long time, for what I understand. It has a ton of followers. Yeah. And basically, what they did was they all got together and was like. We're all going to buy GameStop. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and uh, they so they did. <laughs> yeah, they they found out that a um a bunch of big money investors Whoosh. had has shorted it. Yeah. Um, and you know, for those that don't know, although you've probably heard a hundred times by now because we're we're late into this news, but <laughs> yeah. it's just still worth uh, talking about. Um, it's uh when you're betting against uh, a stock, essentially, you think that a, a stock value is going to go down, and yeah. the way it works is that technically what you're doing is you're borrowing the stock from somebody who owns it and selling it at a, at this price point. And then you, you have to buy the stock to give back to them. 
Yeah. And it's at some point in the future. Yeah. And right. it's usually like uh, they, they set like a time limit or yeah. whatever. Yeah, exactly. So um, the idea is that if the stock value goes down, if you sell it at $10 and it goes down to $5, then when you buy it back at $5 to give back to the person that you borrowed the stock from to sell it in the first place, you've made a little profit of the, of the difference. Yeah. Right. Um, what's crazy is, is so, so you're right. That's, they, they got wind that some of these big, um, hedge funds and stuff mm -hmm. were buying, were shorting the stock. Mm -hmm. And what is crazy is when enough of these people get together on that end to short a stock, they can almost uh, make it the stock price drop just by doing that. Mm -hmm. When enough people are like, oh, well, this isn't going anywhere and they short it, it'll, it'll automatically drop anyway. Right. Um, and so basically what these guys did is they were like, oh, well, we'll all just buy it. Mm -hmm. And so it screws these hedge funds because instead of it going down, it went up. <laughs> yeah. And so as the, yeah, as the competition for buying stock increases, then it pushes the price up. Yeah. And, um, and, at some point, the people that the short sellers have to buy the stock yeah. back. So I, I had um, a buddy that I talked to and he was like, yeah, he was like, so um, now's the time that even though the stock price is way up, he was like, and this was a few weeks ago, so this is all mm -hmm. kind of in the past now, but he was like, it's still good to buy it because mm -hmm. these guys still have to buy it. Like the, the hedge funds still have to, it's going to mm -hmm. go up again. Like yeah. it's even though, even though like everybody's already bought in, like mm -hmm. it has to go up again because all of these, these groups are committed to rebuying it. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and that's the short squeeze. They have to, they yeah. have to buy it at some point. And when they buy it, it also pushes the price up. It pushes up. it up even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so there were some, uh, there were some companies that really took a bath on this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there were some amateurs uh, essentially that, that made off like ba bandits. Yeah. <laughs> and, sure. um, and that's all, I mean, that's all interesting, but, um, the, the after, well, it wasn't exactly the aftermath. It was the reaction to it though, yeah. is what was ended up being the most interesting part. Um, where, you know, a lot of these amateurs were doing, uh, their trading on Robin hood. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, just to add a little nuance to this, it's, there are certainly big money investors that also bought into the stock when they saw what was happening. Oh, right. um, because yeah. they also, first off it, it was a good gamble at that point. And secondly, because they saw an opportunity to, um, to crush their competitors. <laughs> Those, their com <laughs> exactly. Um, why not? Right. Exactly. So, um, anyway, uh, there were, the reactions were, um, that, uh, Robin Hood specifically, um, which is a trading app that charges no commission, which yeah. is why a lot of amateurs use it. Like if you're not, if you're not dealing in bulk, then you want to, you know, keep your commission costs as low as possible. Yeah. Zero is a good it's, one. This is pretty good. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Robin hood stopped allowing people to buy, to it. buy it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they'd let you get out, but they wouldn't let you get in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, or it was like a real big limit. It was like you could buy one share or something like that. I can't remember exactly. They didn't completely yeah. stop them from buying it, but they, they put a, an absurd limit on yeah. how much you could buy. Um, and uh, so here here's the the inside scoop though, is that one of the companies that took, uh, took a bath on this that was stuck in the short squeeze yeah. um, is a company called Citadel. Yeah. And hopefully we have learned by now um, that if a company doesn't charge you for the service, then your data is the product. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so one of the things that Robin Hood does is that they, you know, they get all these buy and sell orders and they aggregate them and they sell off that information to other investing firms yeah. um, who will then make trades ahead of uh of Robin hood putting in the trades for all of its users. Yeah. All right. So that they can, they can get in before the price changes and, and take advantage of that. Um, it's uh front running, I think is what they call it. It's also illegal by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah. but it's not enforced. Yeah. Like nobody does anything about it, but this company Citadel, who's one of the ones that, that lost millions and millions of dollars on this. Yeah. Um, they provide roughly 40% of the revenue to Robin hood by buying the data of the Robin hood users. Yeah. 
So Robinhood was protecting one of their big <laughs> revenue streams, yeah. Um, in a sense, by doing this, yeah. Um, so that's uh, you know, that's part of it anyway. Um, and uh, the the reaction to this uh, that well, you know, we need regulation, we need regulation, etc. Um, you'll notice that this is one of the few times um, in these kind of situations where the regular guys beat the big money. They, they beat traders. the system. Yeah. Yeah. They beat the system. So now suddenly there's all these calls <laughs> for how this needs to be regulated so that we can keep this from happening again. Which by the way, these big companies do exactly what these um Redditors were doing mm -hmm. all the time. Oh yeah. Like this I mean this is a game they play because mm -hmm. they're in the position where they've got the numbers. Right. The only thing that changed here is now the Redditors had the numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean that that was the difference here. Yeah. So I mean, when you when and there has there's been all kinds of talk about regulations and stuff like that. But I mean, what are they going to do? Tell these people that they can't talk about stocks online? I mean, that's I mean beyond. I mean, what kind of regulations can they really put in place to yeah. try to prevent something like this from happening? Mm -hmm. Well, and this is the argument that I would make is that um, this just shows that you don't need regulation. Yeah. That the market corrects itself. This is one of those situations where people, um, by sharing information with each other, yeah. uh, were able to um, to to beat the big money um, yeah. traders. Oh, absolutely! And I hope to see more of it, frankly. Yeah. But this is one thing that it'll do. It'll keep the big money traders in line. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I mean, and that that's they need to be kept in line yeah. because they've been out of control for a long time now. Yeah. In a free market, competition makes the market regulate itself. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, I think, a good example of that. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's important. Oh, I do actually want to also point out, uh, talking about the incestuous nature of this whole thing, yeah. um, on the board of Citadel is uh, Ben Bernanke. Oh, really? You, you may remember him. He's a former Fed chair. Yes, he is. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah. And the I, I think that the real... Um, I think the real story about this is how, uh, like, or what we should be talking about with this is, um, how the federal reserve by controlling the money supply or manipulating the money manipulating, supply, yeah. um, you know, gives the opportunity to make more money to the people that have a lot of money to begin with. It, it, yeah. it benefits the banks it benefits the government, of course. Yeah. Um, and the reason is, and I think we've talked about this before, but the reason is that when you create a whole bunch of money out of nothing, in time, if it's in circulation, um, it does result in inflation. Yeah. That the value of the dollar drops. It takes more dollars to buy the same well, thing. Well, it has to. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and we'll come back to why that is. But um, when the Fed creates a bunch of money, the way they get it into circulation is through the government spending it and through uh, giving it to the banks to spend it, essentially, or buying into stocks, which yeah. is another thing that the Federal Reserve does, that, yeah. um, the quantitative easing. Yeah. And uh, so what happens, though, is that the, the people on the top that already have a bunch of money, they mm. get to spend those dollars when they're still worth the dollar that they were the day before all the money was they created. They full value, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, by the time it trickles down to us poor plebes, yeah. Um, it has lost a, a percentage of its value. Yeah. Um, besides the fact that they're bleeding away any savings that we have and so forth without <laughs> doing anything. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what we should focus on there. And I don't have a problem with increasing the money supply. Um, I, you know, I've been talking a bunch to a friend of ours that has gotten into this, uh, and he, you know, what I, we were talking about Bitcoin and, and other crypto. And I was saying yeah. that I, I prefer, like, I'm not into the crypto thing particularly myself. Like, I like the idea. I yeah. don't think that it works as a uh, currency in its current state. Yeah. Um, but I do like the idea of a, of a decentralized, unregulated currency. Oh, absolutely. Um, and anonymous at that. Yeah. Uh, but, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I was saying that I prefer Ethereum uh, to Bitcoin. And there's a, a couple of reasons. The main one is that it, usually when you see somebody enter a new market, create a new market like Bitcoin did. Yeah. They do really well, but the, because they have the name recognition, they're the first in, et cetera. But usually what happens is that 
somebody that comes behind them that improves on the idea yeah. is the one that really takes hold. Yeah. And I, I think that Ethereum just has a lot more versatility uh, than Bitcoin does. You can attach contracts to it. There's a whole bunch of things. But yeah. one of the other bits is that Bitcoin um, has a cap. There's yeah. only so many Bitcoins that can be. Yeah, yeah. You can't produce anymore. Or... Um, Ethereum doesn't have a cap. It can continue to expand. Yeah. And so I, I or think... Or you could have Dogecoin that's backed by, that they just like throw out there. <laughs> oh, I don't know anything about oh, that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, Dogecoin, that's where everybody went next after GameStop to push the value of Dogecoin up. But the the thing with Dogecoin is, is like there is no limit to how many they can put out. It's not mm -hmm. like Bitcoin or anything. Like there's, there's like as many Dodge coins as there want that they want there to be, there will be. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's kind of like the dollar It's backed by nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the problem that I have with crypto on the whole, like why I'm a gold bug and not a, a crypto person. Yeah. Cause in the, well, first off, if you're trying to prepare for the end of the world or whatever, yeah. Uh, crypto doesn't do anything for you. If you don't have a <laughs> if you don't have a power grid or an internet, then yeah. your crypto is worth absolutely nothing. Yeah, less right. than nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and gold is still valuable. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, at the end of the world, nobody's going to want gold. They're going to want you know ammunition or food or water or whatever. Yeah. I, there's truth in that. Um, yeah. but the barter system is an imperfect system because you have to have something that they want and they have to have something that you want that is roughly of equal value uh, according to the two of you. Yeah. Um, if you have an agreed upon medium of exchange, that improves the system. Yeah. And gold has... Gold has... Throughout history, won the been test that of thing. time. Yeah. yeah, like without question. Now, I, I think like guns and ammo and cigarettes and stuff like that are good things to keep on hand as well. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Working on the prison system. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, man, but like when everything falls, there's a lot of people that like smoking. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and candy. Why not candy? You know, Candy's so, good too. That's what we used to gamble for at Scout Camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it works, man. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, that's why I prefer gold to, to these systems. That it, it is always good to have a medium of exchange that yeah. people agree on the value of. Absolutely. At least roughly. Besides, yeah. gold's easy to separate. Like, yeah. it, in its natural state, it's really soft. It's, like, easy yeah. to, to take apart. You can slice your somebody a piece of yeah. gold. <laughs> and you can wear it, and it looks cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, uh, but anyway, I, I was... The... The reason that not having a cap on Ethereum yeah. is useful is because if you maintain the same um, number of, no, uh, level, I guess, of currency, yeah. um, then the the natural tendency is, is deflation. Yeah. Um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can become bad over time. Um, when you're one Bitcoin... Um, was worth a thousand, you know, that's cool. And then, you know, you continue to improve systems like, uh, you, you create more production, you find more wealth, uh, or free up more wealth by pulling more whatever out of the ground, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, when the, the total wealth in the world increases, but you maintain the same number of, um, units of currency to yeah. represent that, then they become worth the, the currency itself becomes worth more and more and more. Yeah. And that's kind of the goal with Bitcoin. The idea well, was that it, it's going to have value just because there's a, a limited amount. A finite amount, yeah. You know? Well, um, and is that, because I'm, I, like, I know Bitcoin, and, but I'm, I'm not, like, really big into Bitcoin. Is that the reason that the price is, just continues to go up and up? No, is because there's only a certain amount? Um, no, um, and it hasn't just, like, continued to go up and up until now. I mean, yeah. you remember it was up to like 25,000 or something two years ago or whatever, three years ago. I don't remember. Yeah, right now. Something like that. Um, and it went back down to, to, uh, right around 1500, I think is the lowest it got 1600, somewhere in there. Maybe. Um, but no, that's not the reason right now. The reason is because everybody's trying to jump into it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, they see its value going up. They've been convinced that, oh, well, you know, this is a great store of value, which I don't, agree with you. I don't think that there's enough of a track record to, to say that. Yeah. Um, so you think maybe Bitcoin's in a bubble then? I do. I think all uh, crypto's in a crypto's bubble. Crypto's in a bubble. Yeah. I can um, see that. My prediction would be uh, that the value of everything is going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but I think that the value of crypto goes down before the value of everything else, before the stock market, as an example, goes down. Yeah. Because I think that all the money that they're printing at the Fed yeah. um, is going to inflate the market and make people feel confident in the economy again. And when people are feeling confident in the economy, they're less likely to be interested in crypto. And if they're not buying crypto, then the value goes down. It's going to drop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think crypto values drop before the stock market values drop. And yeah. then when the stock market values drop, I figure crypto probably drops some more because if yeah. everybody's poor, nobody's buying anything. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, and that's what's happened with gold historically is that yeah. when the stock market drops, the value of gold drops too because nobody's buying gold Nobody. because they can't buy anything. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know though. This is yeah. just a guess. So, yeah, I mean, just, you know. just, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the... You know, being able to expand the currency base with Ethereum is an advantage because you can you can more easily maintain a constant value of the coin. Yeah. yeah. Um, because the way you create wealth is through improved efficiency. So more production for less input yeah. uh, creates wealth. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, freeing up natural resources that had uh, had been trapped before, yeah. finding a new oil well and tapping it, yeah. um, digging more gold out of the ground. Yeah. Uh, you know, all these kind of things also create more wealth in the world. The wealth is not yeah. a fixed pie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Absolutely. there might be a finite... Well, actually, no, there's never even a finite amount of wealth because... Uh, production um, efficiencies can be introduced that also create wealth. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, the idea is that it, then you can more easily maintain a, a, a regular value of your currency if you can increase the number of units of that currency with the the wealth that's created. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and that would make sense. And like we were talking, I remember we were talking the other night as far as with Bitcoin and Ethereum, like, to me, it just makes more sense because, like, you don't want to have all of this money and it, the value of it constantly be changing, like mm -hmm. with Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I mean, I look at Bitcoin more as an investment vehicle and not as much as a currency just because it's the value is so volatile. Up, volatile. Yeah. yeah. You want something that's going to be stable that you know one is going to be one mm -hmm. for a long time. Like, right. you know. Yeah. Which unfortunately isn't true of your dollar. Either, <laughs> yeah, it's like, really, it's not true with the dollar right now. <laughs> yeah. at least. It, um, but yeah, the, the idea, I mean, even the dollar is not nearly as volatile as crypto is. Oh yeah. No, without so. question. Yeah, I agree. Um, it doesn't work as a currency right now because it can't maintain a regular value. Um, and it is really only valuable as an investment vehicle. Another problem, of course, is that you can't pay for everything with Bitcoin. Yeah, you can pay for a lot of stuff with Bitcoin. You can. Um, more and more. But like I say, I mean, you're not going to go to the grocery store and buy yeah. stuff, at least around here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there may be places you can. That's probably true. But, um, but yeah, you definitely... You're not, not in South Alabama. Yeah, not down here you can. No. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, And then, uh, of course... This is now I'm also interested in crypto though because it is the it is a way out of fiat currency. Yeah. Yeah. Um and even uh the European Central Bank um head whatever they call their head. I don't, I don't remember. Um Christine Lagarde anyway uh said in a in a um speech or interview or somewhere. I don't remember where exactly, but I heard her say that Bitcoin was the off ramp to the Euro. Oh yeah. Um, or from the Euro. Yeah. And I, I think that now she was saying that is a negative thing. Yeah, that's obviously uh, not what she wants, but, yeah. but everybody um, else can be like, Hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, but she's right about that. It is yeah. it, the alternative to the fiat currencies is a good thing. If we could get it into general use. Yeah. Well, I hadn't read anything, but I just saw a headline the other day. That, I should have pulled that clip. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish I had read a little deeper into some of the stuff about Bitcoin, but I did mm -hmm. see a headline the other day that um, they're talking about legislation saying that uh, companies and stuff regulating how much they can invest in cryptocurrencies, mm -hmm. particularly Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and that's, to me, that's a dangerous road because, I mean, who's what, who is the government to tell a private business what they can invest in. Right. Like, I mean, that scares me. Like, yeah, that's certainly an issue. And the government is the, uh, the X factor in all of this. Yeah. Um, because, well, yeah, because the government can shut Bitcoin down tomorrow and mm -hmm. there ain't a thing you can do. Yeah, exactly. Other than one when you've got a bunch of money in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, and there's a couple of ways that they can do it. 
Um, one is that they can make it illegal to uh, do transactions in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, they can't track them, but that means that every transaction that you do in Bitcoin is illegal. It's illegal, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and then they can definitely make that case, which they've started to make with uh, with physical dollars, with actual currency, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, well, it's only used for criminal activity, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Yeah. Um, the other thing, and this is what I would say is the most likely way that they they put the kibosh on Bitcoin or, or other cryptos, yeah. is to say that... Um, is to threaten business licenses. Oh, if no. you accept crypto, yeah. we're going to revoke your business license. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that, that kind of seals that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and unfortunately, they can do that. Yeah. I, I don't think that they should be able to. I don't think you should need a license to run a business. Well, but, I was fixing to say, yeah, I don't, yeah, I believe business licenses is, is crazy. Like, who yeah. says I need a license to run a business? But, yeah, you know, that's the world we live in. Yeah. Like, if I got something people want and they're willing to give me something for it, then why should I have to get the as, approval as of the government? As complicated as this should be, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but unfortunately, yeah, you have to have a business license everywhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the most likely way. Um, that they, that in they the same way that them, I was yeah. saying that they would do, um, to enforce, uh, COVID, um, restrictions yeah. is to say, well, if you don't do it this way, then we're just going to take your license away. Yeah. There you go. Like there's, mm -hmm. yeah, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, think about that's how they, uh, that's how they got around, um, the constitution when they were doing, uh, prohibition of marijuana as an yeah. example, um, controlling firearms, same thing. Well, you, well, what we need you to do is we need to, uh, you to get a license in order to do that. And then we just don't issue any licenses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so really common way of, of taking advantage and yeah. why nobody fights about business licenses. I'm not sure. Or licenses of any in, kind. Really. In general, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. So. Um, I mean, I guess that's really all I have on that. Uh, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? No, I think it looks like pretty well covers it. Yeah. Um, the next thing is just like this movement against people outside the mainstream. Yeah. And um, I, I would say that the, the best example of this right now is the thing with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, yeah. She's... A, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I heard sure that, that too. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure that didn't get picked up on the mic, but I've got a, I've got a cat that's yelling at me outside <laughs> yeah, the door. I just heard a big yowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, was removed from a uh, committees mm -hmm. um, in Congress, and she's an elected representative in Georgia or for Georgia yep. to the to the federal House of Representatives, and uh, she was removed by. She's a Republican. She was removed by the Democrats, as I understand it, from these yep. committees. Yep. Um, it is not the first time that somebody has been removed from committees, but I think that it is the first time that they've been removed f from committees by the other party. My understanding is that this is a first as far as by other part, by, by the opposing party, that the opposing party removes somebody um, in this manner, you know, at, yeah. at least from what I've seen. Um, and that, to me, that's what makes this a big deal. Like it, I would have a problem with it if the Republicans and the Democrats had kind of joined that. I still mm -hmm. wouldn't really be for it because it was, she was still elected by the people to be there. Yeah. Um, but I really have a problem with it being a partisan thing. Mm -hmm. Um, that's well, that, and they set up a bad, uh, a bad precedent anyway, because does that mean that when the, when the Republicans control a committee, if they don't like the, a Democrat on it, they can kick them off? Yeah. I mean, they can. I mean, this, this shows that, that you, they can. And yeah, you can, you can say that, well, she like, she, cause the, the claim is, is that like she was promoting violence or something like that. But all of the stuff that they, that she said was before the, the voters knew about it. All of that stuff was all said before mm -hmm. she was elected yeah. to Congress. So, I mean, if, if she was, if, if the people didn't agree with her, they shouldn't have voted for her. Yeah. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> yeah. There is a real problem, though, with, um, as you're saying, um, with them limiting the power of a, an elected representative that they don't like. Yeah. Because that person was elected by their constituency to represent them. They thought that she would represent them well. And yep. because the, the general, the mainstream, doesn't like what she 
represents, they have limited her influence. And by the way, she did bend the knee, as it were, too, because she did come out and say when they were having these hearings or whatever they were having to to remove her, she came out and said, look, I've learned a lot since all of this. I mm-hmm. made some very bad Facebook posts that I now regret. Like, I mean, she didn't, for me, she didn't have to do any of that. Mm-hmm. But the fact that she did come out and at least be like, you look, you know, I don't, I don't believe this stuff anymore. Like mm-hmm. I was in a bad place, blah, 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 blah. And to still remove her for stuff that she said that she's now going back against. I mean, that's just, uh, to me, that's too much. Yeah. Like I, I can't, <laughs> I just, it blows my mind that that's where we're at. Yeah. Well, and I have a problem with the idea of freshman senators and freshman congressmen, how they're not supposed to put any bills in or whatever. And like, there is no seniority in these places. Yeah. It's not supposed to be. be. They're supposed yeah. to be a representative of their constituents, and they're supposed to be all equal. That's the point of a representative re- or representative representative republic. Yeah, well, and it, it is crazy how long people stay there, because I saw something the other day, I guess our one of our congressman i'm not sure if he's in the house or the senate but shelby is not running for Mm re-election and it's like they were talking about and god he's been there forever man like i mean that's and there's no no reason for that like these guys do not need to stay there that long so so let's see if we can get a libertarian in that position i do that wouldn't it be nice well that's exactly what i thought Mm -hmm. i was like hmm (laughs) well um i mean this extends beyond that there's been uh a real push to limit the extremes, um, yeah. both in terms, they say, uh, you know, freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. which is, I've heard that, you know, which is ridiculous that there's another part of the, the whole, um, first amendment thing. Yeah. Um, and, and it includes publication. Yeah. So, you know, if you can get somebody to publish you, then you're, yeah, they can't stop it. That's yeah. the whole idea. But they're they're trying to limit that as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so they don't infringe on the freedom freedom of speech. They're trying to infringe on the freedom of publication. Yeah. Um, that's and that's dang, especially in the age we live in, yeah. because one of the glorious things about the time we live in is anybody can get on Facebook, Twitter, mm-hmm. any of these things, and put your opinion out there. Yeah. For everybody to see. And, and that's a good thing. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's that marketplace of ideas right yeah. there, you know. And I should probably clarify that point. Um, in the First Amendment, there's five different rights that are enumerated. Yeah. Um, and, of course, the there's freedom of religion, um, freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom to for redress of grievances. Yeah. Uh, which they're also trying to limit. Yeah. Um, and assembly. Actually, they're attacking the whole First they're, Amendment, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. Um, it's all coming down. <laughs> but those other two are freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And yeah. when they were writing the First Amendment, when they said freedom of the press, they didn't mean a class of people of journalists. Yeah. Um, Something they got to get a license against because it, but, yeah, yeah, again. They, they weren't really big on licenses back then. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's um, a new thing. What They literally meant freedom of the printing press. Yeah. So yeah. that if you could get somebody to publish your work, the government couldn't stop that. Exactly. Right. I mean, publishers, of course, still have their own choices to make, but well, yeah. um, the government couldn't interfere with that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it was really saying that you have the right to your own opinion and you have the right to disseminate that opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, And it's all under attack right now in, yeah. in strange ways. Yeah. Um, it, they are going after the radical left, too. Yeah. Um, as well as the radical right, but they're also going after a lot of like just right of center right. Yeah. Um, and I think that they're like, I feel like, um, that we have already stated on this podcast many times that our opinion is that there is very little difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. Yes. Um, or at least the mainstream Republicans and mainstream Democrats. Yeah. Um, I, I think that anything, they're, they're trying to push this into a monoparty system or uniparty. I don't know. A single, single party single system. Party. I like that. <laughs> um, to a single party system. And, uh, you know, it, there is some value that's created by making these two parties and having them at each other's throats publicly so that it, it's a dividing strategy for the people, actually. Yeah. Um, but when it comes down to it, everything that really affects their, your life 
is bipartisan in its support. Yeah. Um, and so you don't need it. There's like differences in how much they want to spend on various aspects of it, but that's really it. Well, I mean, they both want to spend all of your money. Yeah. Um, one wants to focus a little bit more on security and one wants to focus a little bit more on, um, on domestic, uh, economy, yeah. but there's not really that much difference between them. Yeah. And the, the small government Republicans have been gone for a long uh, time. That's like a true. long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, that doesn't, there's exist. only a few left. Yeah. Um, and yeah. they're being marginalized. Yeah. Um, and so the January 6th incident has mm-hmm. been another catalyst for, uh, for this push. It seems to me, yeah. um, to try and limit the opinions that are acceptable. Uh, by casting everybody right of center as a, a bigot and a racist and whatever else, terrible name, Nazi, that yeah. they can call you. Um, and in fact, uh, let's go ahead and play this clip here. Um, so this is uh, Robert Grenier, who is the uh, former station chief in Islamabad, uh, CIA station chief in Islamabad, Pakistan on 9-11. And sure. um, he was being asked about how to deal with the ins- Insurrection, yeah. insurrectionists, <laughs> which is a ridiculous term for this. I mean, we won't get into that again. But no, yeah. um, anyway, for the people that uh, that marched on the Capitol on January sixth, and um, these violent extremists, um, and now being referred to as domestic terrorists, because you know, if yeah. we apply the term terrorist to somebody, that means we can do whatever we want to them. Yeah. And to me, that's the most dangerous thing. Like if these, I'm all for these people being charged with whatever crimes they committed, like breaking and entering and Mm -hmm. things like that. Absolutely. Charge them all day with that because they did that. But there's a push at least to have these people like life in prison and like Mm -hmm. under these trumped up charges of, of just like you say, of terrorism and things like that. No, charge them for the crimes they committed and let that be that. Yeah. Um, but if what, you can prove it, <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, and, and I think in the trial is an important part of this. Don't well, just yeah. send them to get my well, yeah, and no, and I, <laughs> you make up you, you bring up a good point because, yeah, because there's a fair chance in some of these instances, at least, when you throw these people in front of a jury, like they may get acquitted, mm-hmm. even if they if, if through just like um nullification. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that'll happen in many of them, but the, yeah. it could happen in some of these instances, at least yeah. when you put these people in front of a jury and they're like, yeah, this, this doesn't live up to that, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That's, I don't know. That's just kind of my thought. Well, um, this is a, in an interview with NPR. Um, again, they're asking Robert Grenier how, how he can apply his knowledge of dealing with insurgents in Pakistan and Afghanistan to U.S. citizens. Um, and his opinion is that uh, that we can use counterinsurgency tactics um, as effectively against U.S. citizens as we did against uh, um, the Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and listen to this clip, and, and then uh, there are some comments. All right. And the thrust of our campaign there was, yes, to hunt down Al-Qaeda, but primarily to uh, remove the supportive environment in which they were able uh, to flourish. And that meant fighting the Taliban. And I think that is the heart of what we need to deal with here. Um, hunting down people who are, who are criminals, that is something that which U.S. law enforcement is very well capable of doing and doing while preserving uh, fundamental uh, civil rights. Mm-hmm. That's in some ways the easiest part of the problem. The difficult part of the problem is... Uh, affecting the environment within which violent elements otherwise would be able to thrive. Okay. So there's a couple of interesting reveals there. First off, uh, note that he says that when we went into the Middle East after 9-11, even though that we knew that Al-Qaeda was responsible for bringing the towers down, um, that Al-Qaeda was responsible for 9-11, that our primary thrust was to go after the Taliban. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though they had nothing to do with yeah. 9-11. And that there weren't that many Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan anyway. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and that's, uh, if you want to hear a really interesting discussion about those aspects of this comment, um, I recommend everybody go listen to Scott Horton's interview with John Kiriakou recently. Okay. Um, uh, John Kiriakou is a former CIA 
uh, agent. He's actually the only person who was prosecuted for the CIA torture program, oh, um, no. but he was prosecuted for revealing it, <laughs> yeah. not for participating, not for participating in it. it. By the way, Scott Horton has been everywhere right now because he's got that book out and everybody should go buy that book. I got my copy. Yeah, yeah. Go get that book. That is, like I say, because yeah, he is, he's been every show I listen to, I feel like he's on it and it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. He's a hero. Yes, definitely. Um, so there's, you know, that aspect of it where, and so it makes you question, by the way, um, how effective these counterinsurgency tactics have worked. Uh, if there were very few Al Qaeda members, um, to begin with, <laughs> to begin with, and now we have thousands of them. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyway, but the, the other part of that is that he's talking about, you know, hunting down, um, the criminals and, what then does he mean by destroying the environment that that fosters them? Yeah. Like, who is that? That that's what worried me the most from that clip. And yeah, I I don't I what does he mean by that? Like, because I don't know. Like, well, if the comparison is Al Qaeda and the Taliban, then what he's it seems to me that what yeah. he's talking about is that the people that actually stormed the capital are the Al Qaeda, yeah. but the primary thrust should be the right half of America. Yeah. That these people grew out of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would, I mean, I don't know how else you really would take that. I mean, you're right. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, because the more you push a group down and I, I say this all the time and I probably said it on here a million times, but the more you marginalize and push a group down, the more likely they're become are that they are to become violent. Like yeah. that's just the nature of things. Like when your voice has been silenced, what else are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Well, and then the question becomes, is that the goal here? Maybe. Is to, is to trigger an event that is um, outrageous enough that they can get the nation on board with well, jailing the right half of America or well, whatever. And, and you're not or the, you're, hunting down these criminals. Yeah. And when a CIA, a CIA guy says hunt down. Yeah. I have to wonder about the meaning there. Oh, yeah, like, without question. And the the truth is, is they're already trying to do that with this event. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there. Are, I, I saw, I heard just today that Nancy Pelosi is pushing for a 9-11 style investigation into what happened at the Capitol. And yeah. it's like, man, they, like they're not going to let go of this. And, and I do think you may be right that they're pushing for something bigger that they could really do something with. Yeah. Because the truth is most of the American people are like, all right, yeah, that wasn't cool, but it's not what they're making it out to be. Right. Um, so, I mean, what, when does the next shoe fall? Like, I mean, what, when the next thing happens, how are they? Cause that's all they're waiting on is the, is the, something like nine 11, something big to happen mm -hmm. where they can take their opportunity. Yeah. And the fact is they haven't gotten it yet, but what, what, what's going to happen when they do, yeah. when something does happen? I mean, because we don't want a nine 11 style commission to come out mm -hmm. because I mean, all we ended up with that was, the, was the Patriot act and we don't want a Patriot act except oh, no, turned no, no. in Patriot on us. Act was way before. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just commission. saying like, but nine 11 you, triggered that though. Yeah. Um, but the nine 11 commission investigation, um, yeah. was this, uh, partisan, um, uh, partisan commission that essentially it seems that the goal was to, uh, play up, um, the, the value of the government and to downplay the information that they had beforehand that could have helped them prevent yeah. the event to begin with. Yeah. Um, and, and also to downplay the activities of our, uh, of our close ally in Saudi Arabia that was actually <laughs> responsible for this, yeah. um, and allow us to go after the target that we really wanted to go after in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the whole thing was great big lie and I don't know, and maybe that's exactly what she means when she that says 9-11 commission. And I do think that's exactly what she means. And and they want this big event so they can, I, I do think that the goal is, is to have a, a Patriot Act style legislation except pointed inward at the country. Um, like, I, I just, I, that's what I see coming out of this. And I don't think we've had the event yet because this, this deal at the, at the Capitol isn't it, but they're looking for it. Okay. You're going to have to cold, hold this for a second because there's something that I want to read on here and I don't have it in here. Okay. Um, so 
Keep on talking. <laughs> Dude, you can't make me do that. You know uh, how this works. Yeah. You can talk. I mean, t- say what you regret saying. Be right back. <laughs> Mike's leaving me at the mic. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> Yeah, you're just going. I don't hear any talking. What the hell? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I've been reading. Uh, let me get in front of the mic again. All right. um, so I've been reading the Gulag Archipelago, finally. Um, I, I wish I'd read this long ago. I haven't quite finished it. I'm about three quarters of the way through, maybe a little more. Um, this is a really big book, by the that way. That looks like a really big um, book. <laughs> I got the abridged version. It's still almost 500 pages. Uh, someday I hope to have enough time to read the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but it has already been like really influential. And it's one of these things that I really think that everybody should read. Yeah. Like you should get a real understanding of what was going on in the Soviet Union in terms of the oppression um, oh, man. and the limitation of opinions. So just to give a little bit of an idea, I wanted to read this paragraph. And this Absolutely. is very early in the book. Um, he says, uh, arrests rolled through the streets and apartment houses like an epidemic. Just as people transmit an epidemic infection from one to another without knowing it, by such innocent means as a handshake, a breath, handing someone something, so too they passed on the infection of inevitable arrest by a handshake, by a breath, by a chance meeting on the street. For if you were destined to confess tomorrow that you organized an underground group to poison the city's water supply, and if today I shake hands with you on the street, that means I too am doomed. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about this book the other day. Like, that's not the world we want to live in. Yeah. Like, and I do, I really do feel, I fear that that's the road we're heading down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are they are really pushing this guilt by associate, association stuff, which is exactly yeah. what he's yeah. talking about there. Yeah. Um, that you could be completely innocent of anything. And actually, the guy, the you know, as you keep reading the book, you certainly get the impression that the guy who confessed to um, help plot the, to poison the city's water supply. Yeah. He didn't actually do that either. (laughs) Right. (laughs) He was just compelled to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a scary thing, man. And we're Americans. Like we're not supposed to live Mm -hmm. in that type of fear. Like uh, we, we don't like, and the truth is, is I believe that at least where we're at down here in the South, like we're not going to stand for it. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I talk to people all day, every day I work in and I talk with a lot of people like we're not going to stand for some of this stuff. Well, you say that, but there's, I mean, and while there are, uh, there are sections or segments of the cities around here where you can walk into stores and see that they're completely ignoring the like mask orders and things like that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of places where that's not true yeah. too. Uh, I, people are surprisingly well, compliant and it, obsequious. It is funny that you mentioned that because like you go from town to town to town just here in Baldwin County and you see both sides. Like mm-hmm. I'll walk in stores here in Daphne and like I'll be the only one not wearing a mask. I'm like, man, I'm fixing to get ran out of this building. Yeah. Um, and then I go to other cities and like, nobody is wearing masks, mm-hmm. like period. Yeah. So it, it is weird how you see that. Yeah. Um, I was at the fresh market the other day and I was excited because there were three other people in there that were not wearing masks. Yeah. Well, and over here that's like, yeah, you don't, you don't see a whole lot of that. So, so I'm glad to finally see some pushback on this, but, and obviously what he's talking about, what Alexander Solzhenitsyn is talking about is a lot more extreme, but, um, but it starts somewhere. Yeah. That's my thing. And that's, that's the thing that I kind of want to get across to people is, is it starts somewhere Mm -hmm. and it, and then it grows and it grows and it grows. Um, we got it. We got to cut it off at the head now. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, the only way to defeat it is to not comply. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, I I mean, I'm not sure where we're going here and I don't want to be too alarmist. Uh, but I, I think that we just had something of a dress rehearsal with this pandemic stuff about, what the government can get away with telling you you can and can't do. Yeah. Um, if you think about some of these orders about how many people you're allowed to have in your house, it's my house. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now, now there's this push and this weird guilt by association thing. And that if you, um, supported or ever supported Trump or somebody anywhere close to him or somebody else that supported him, you know, how many degrees of separation, I don't know. Uh, then you are um, 
you are a radical and you need to be shut down. Well, and, and something that you just kind of have to remember is all of these things are happening simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Like, so we're dealing with the, with the pandemic and the lockdowns and stuff like that. At the same time, when we've got all of this Black Lives Matter stuff going on mm-hmm. and the stuff with shutting down speech and shutting down Trump's Twitter account, like mm-hmm. all of this stuff is kind of happening at the same time right now. And you just have to wonder where we end up at the end of it. Yeah. And and what we do now affects where we end up at the end of it. Yeah. And uh, you got to you got to resist the fear because that's the most powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and that's what brought about the the stuff after 9/11 was mm-hmm. fear. And I remember yeah. that because I lived through that pretty well and I I mean I was right there with everybody else like the mm-hmm. terrorists are coming, you know. Yeah. Um and we we got to get them over there so they don't get us over here. Over there so we don't fight them over yeah. here. Like I remember all of that, yeah. and and you know, I mean, I didn't have the best opinions on some of it at the time, but I did see through the Patriot Act. Mm-hmm. Like I like I knew as soon as that came that that was garbage and that we don't stand for that type of thing. But it happened anyway. Yeah, and then it was renewed as the Freedom Act. Yeah, you know, some years later. Exactly. Um, and and actually, it was the it was the Freedom Act more than anything that inspired me to to talk to you about starting this podcast. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it took us a while though. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But the, the inspiration was there. (laughs) So no, uh, uh, resist. Yeah. Resist. Resist. We much. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And about which we must be able or whatever he said, something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it it is important to try and to, to see through this and, Um, you know, just be aware that the, the, one of the great tools, and this is something that they'll lose actually by, um, uh, by going to a single party system. Yeah. Um, cause they, they've got the right left divide that they play so well, yeah. um, right now, but then there's just other ways to divide you. So there's, you know, we, they've yeah. been pushing the racial divide for, uh, at least four years. Yeah. Um, now, um, and uh, they've been pushing the gender divide. Uh, there's a whole lot of ways that people can be divvied up and make you look at your neighbor as a as an enemy of yours, yeah. and think of your government as the savior that's trying to even things up or protect you from that neighbor or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. And just know that that's a tool that governments use to keep you under their thumb. Yep. Oh, that's true. So. And that seems like a good place to stop, I suppose, for the night. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like that's a good good stopping point, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, admonitions. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. But everything will be fine. Yeah. Just stand up for yourselves. Yeah. Um and uh I know we say this every time and sometimes it just doesn't work out, but life is a life is a crazy thing. Yeah. Um there's a lot going on right now. Yeah. In, in everywhere. My, yeah. <laughs> um, your life, my life, yeah. everybody's lives. So we're, we're trying to keep it as regular as possible. And like I said, uh, if we're going to have a long break, like this last one, um, like we may miss a week here and there, but if we're going to miss more than a week, then I will just, uh, repost an old, an old podcast so that we can get some content out and not leave you guys yeah. with silence for too long. Yeah. Um, but the intention right now, yeah. is that we will be back in about a week when we finally get this right. Um, and in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.